My name is Tom Alritz, and I'm the interim director here at the Newark Public Library. And on behalf of the trustees, administration, and staff, I want to welcome you to the library and to the kickoff celebration for the library's Black History Month. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Lauren Wells, our newly elected board president, <laughs> Timothy Christ, our former board president, and some unknown former mayor named Sharp James. Where, 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 Sh oh, there he is in, in the Giants uniform. So this kicks off our Black History Celebration, the exhibit, the Black Athlete in America Protest, Activism and Inclusion opens today. I hope you will take a look at it this evening or come back for a special visit. And throughout the month of February, there will be programs related to this exhibit for the Black History exhibit on the Black Athlete. So get a flyer or look on our website, npl.org. Also, you might want to take a look on the third floor, either today or on another visit, at our newly opened exhibit called Radical Women. Someone told me there's some radical women here tonight, but I'm not sure. Radical women about the women in New Jersey and Newark who were some of the big movers to help get the right for all women to vote. 100 years ago, the anniversary of that amendment. And the struggle for women's rights, of course, didn't end with that amendment. It's still something that's going on. So take a look at that exhibit, which tells something about the history, especially of African-American women and immigrant women who participated and were big leaders in that struggle, but are virtually unknown. We did a lot of original research to uncover these women. So please visit the two exhibits, The Black Athlete and Radical Women. And I'd like to uh, extend a special thanks to the sponsor of our Black History Month programs, PNC. They have been sponsoring PNC Bank. They've been sponsoring our Black History Celebration for so long, I can't remember when it started, but it's You'll let me know. And it's, it's been a, group, a great partnership that we've had year after year that we know reliably that we're going to be able to do a new good program each year. And the person who's here who's going to speak tonight with some greetings is Linda Bowden, who's not only the New Jersey Regional President for PNC Bank, but also an actual library supporter who's come out to support us very well on a couple of occasions. So I'm happy to welcome a person who's not only someone who saw that someone gave some money, she actually participated in our events. And we're thrilled to have her here this evening. I'd like to welcome Linda Bowden. I, I have to say, not only am I a library supporter, I'm a former teacher. Any, any teachers or former teachers in the room tonight? I'm sure, yeah, 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 God bless teachers. <laughs> That's what I would say. So anyway, we are delighted to be here on behalf of the many PNC. This entire front area here is filled with PNC colleagues. That's how excited we are about tonight. So on behalf of my colleagues, let me tell you how honored we are to be here tonight. It is a thrill for us. It's one of our favorite events. And Tom, I know you weren't sure of the first year. This is our 13th, 13th year in terms of sponsoring the, the Newark Public Library. Thank you. And it's, it's Black History Month celebration. And for those of you who don't know PNC, there may be a few of you here tonight. Uh, let me say we do have a long-standing history even further back than 13 years ago of supporting the library and we have a deep commitment to the city of Newark and of course this is a wonderful way for us to uh, celebrate Newark tonight. And before I go any further I do have to say Tom congratulations to you. Kirsten I know you're somewhere here in the audience and to all of your staff for putting on yet another month of celebrations that are just going to be terrific. 
So why are we here? You may be sitting there saying, what does a library have to do with a bank? And why are they connected in any way, shape, or form? And for us, it's very simple. We're here to celebrate the beauty and the vitality of the African-American culture. That's our goal tonight. That is why we are here during Black History Month. And for us, um, the focus of this year's exhibit focused on society, especially through the lens of sports and athletics, offers us a terrific window of the many, many aspects of the past several years, whether it's free speech, First Amendment rights, the issues surrounding representation, diversity, leadership, leadership and strength in the face of adversity. The sporting world reflects so many of those aspects, and I would make sure that you have a chance to walk around the room and see a lot of representation of that. We're also very fortunate to have a guest speaker with us tonight, the New York, I say New Jersey, Giants um, defensive, <laughs> excuse me, the, uh, the defensive end George Martin, who has personally experienced and exhibited all of these qualities. So George, we are so looking forward to your remarks. And lastly, in closing, I just have to say that there couldn't be a better place than this beautiful library, a better location than the great city of Newark to kick off tonight's events. And please, if you haven't had a tour yet of the library, make certain that you do that. Put that on your immediate bucket list. So enjoy the evening, enjoy the month, and thank you, everyone. Good evening. My name is Dale Colson. I'm the librarian for this space, the James Brown African American Room. I'm also the curator of the exhibit. This room is named in honor of the late James Library Brown, a poet, activist, and influencer who was instrumental in making sure that the library seek and maintain books and resources and present programs examining and celebrating the African American experience. The first black athletes in America were enslaved men who were commanded to compete. Some boxed, some ran foot races, others rolled logs, paddled boats, and many rode horses. Excelling in sport gave these athletes an elevated place in society, even during their enslavement. Throughout history, the black athletes' abilities have afforded these talented few a protected status, but almost always with conditions. This year's exhibit, The Black Athlete in America, Protests, Activism, and Inclusion, highlights some of the athletes, coaches, trainers, and front office personnel who contributed to the rich and important history of the black athlete in America. There's a bit about Bill Richmond, a boxer who was born enslaved in 1763 on what is now Staten Island. Included two are current events, including a tribute to future Hall of Fame Kobe Bryant. Along with text, photos, and video are four priceless editions. Dr. Thomas McCabe, a Rutgers professor, provided a 1922 photo of Kearney High School soccer team. Seated in the front row is Leonard Rainey, the only African-American student athlete on the team. Dr. McCabe also loaned a pair of child soccer cleats, which are about 100 years old. They were purchased at an antique shop in London that was a gift from his wife, so we thank Dr. McCabe. A replica North Eagles Monty Irvin baseball jersey hangs in the center of the gallery. We are excited to have an authentic autographed Monty Irvin baseball in the exhibit. It's on loan, courtesy of my friend Deborah Irvin and the Irvin family. We thank them. On loan from his private collection is the LP Stand Up and Be Counted, an LP created in the spirit of 1968 Olympic activism. The album is autographed by Mexico City Olympian, the legendary John Carlos. Thank you to my colleague, Reggie Blanding, for allowing this vinyl to be included in this exhibit. When I was preparing this exhibit, I ran across a photo of Spike Lee and a gentleman standing in front of a huge painting of boxing great Joe Lewis. I later discovered that this gentleman was the British artist Alexander Van Armstrong. After finding his website, I asked him if he might consider loaning us the Joe Lewis painting for the exhibit. Mr. Van Armstrong replied that he would be honored. We are honored and thank Mr. Van Armstrong for his generous loan of two giant paintings, Joe Lewis III and Muhammad Ali. And we thank Mr. Van Armstrong in his absence. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank Assistant Director Ingrid Betancourt for allowing me the opportunity to curate this exhibit. I appreciate her continued support. Again, I'd like to thank my colleague Reggie Blanding for his revisions and edits. I'd like to thank our, our IT department for putting together the video montage in the gallery and graphic designers Linda Lubdell and Russell L. Simmons for their assistance. And lastly, thank you to exhibit installers Dan Schnur and Brian Beaton. And as Tom mentioned, the exhibit runs through April 30th, so if you don't have an opportunity to see it today, please come back. Our host for the evening is Anthony Avent, a retired American professional basketball player who was selected by the Atlanta Hawks in the first round in 1991 NBA draft. He is the founder of Make Me a Prodigy, a nonprofit organization that mentors youth in the game of basketball and careers in sports. Please read more about him in the program. But please welcome, please help me welcome our host, Anthony Avon. Greetings. How's everybody doing? Happy you all were able to make it out tonight. So let me start by reiterating. My name is Anthony Aben, and I am your host of the evening. In honor of Black History Month, today's discussion is on sports and activism and inclusion. Sport activism is when athlete coaches and other prominent stakeholders in sports choose to use their platform and visibility to advocate for positive changes in our world. Athletes have used their platform dating back as early as heavyweight champion Jack Johnson, his choice to be with who he loves despite one's race. Rutgers football All-American actor-singer Paul Robinson breaking down barriers and cultural norms. To the Dodgers' Jackie Robinson integration of baseball and Kurt Flood Supreme Court antitrust suit against Major League Baseball. Basketball greats Bill Russell, Oscar Robinson, Spencer Haywood, fighting, segregation, and players' right to unionize and to play a sport and make a living. Boxing heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali refusal to join the military and other injustices, Olympian gold and silver winners Tommy Smith, John Carlos, protesting human rights and discrimination in America. Tennis great Arthur Ashe participating during apartheid in South Africa to bring about integration. Can't forget Althea Gibson being the first African American to compete in the US Open. We salute today's athletes in their stance against any injustice and the sacrifices they're willing to take to bring about change. Being on a public platform, going against the forces of change is not easy. It takes courage, conviction, discipline, and support. In closing, today we salute Newark's own, the great Cleo Hill. Cleo Hill, a Southside High School graduate, a New Jersey All-State All-American basketball player who attended Wisdom-Salem Teachers College in the late 50s, early 60s. Cleo was the first African-American basketball player drafted into the NBA from an HBCU school. But Cleo faced an uphill battle being drafted by the St. Louis Hawks, an area of the country clinging to their old ways. In 1960, the Amsterdam News wrote, Cleo Hill, the greatest player, dead or alive. But such celebrity and basketball brilliance wasn't enough to overcome the racist minds of the time. Cleo, with the encouragement of Bill Russell doing an exhibition game in Kentucky, stays the sit-in where they weren't being served. This would have major repercussions for Cleo back in St. Louis seen as disobedient, arrogant, and overconfident, Cleo was blacklisted from the NBA. During a conversation with great commentator, Billy Packer, Wake Forest basketball player, quote, Cleo Hill was a transcending talent 
that would have changed the game in the ways of Oscar Robinson and Magic Johnson. Cleo lost a lot when his passion and God-given gift for the game was taken away. Today and every day, we salute Cleo Hill. Last. Last week, we lost a basketball great, Kobe Bryant. He was a role model, a mentor, a husband, and a father. Kobe's passion and love for his daughters were putting his imprint on women's basketball and leading the change to influence the game for the positive. To sport fans everywhere, no matter what stance athletes take, you still hold the biggest impact. Your participation as viewers, ticket purchases, merchandise, etc., will all, and you will tell owners and corporate supporters what is and what isn't acceptable in our society. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Retired New York football giant, Super Bowl 21st co-captain, Mr. Martin is founder of a journey for 9-11. A journey for 9-11 was the ongoing nationwide initiative to raise awareness about the funds to help mitigate the serious medical conditions, including chronic bronchial diseases, leukemia, and other cancers, post-traumatic stress disorder. Faced by thousands of 9-11 rescue and recovery workers who were all ill as direct results of their service at Ground Zero. From September the 16th, 2007 to June 21st, 2008, Mr. Martin traversed on foot 3,000 plus miles on his journey raising more than $5 million in the process for this nonprofit organization. Mr. Martin, that's a lot of walking. On a journey for 9-11, Mr. Martin passed through portions of 13 states, including New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. You didn't think I would end. The retired NFL great lost more than 40 pounds during this track during which he visited schools, firehouses, police stations, government offices, and other places where he raised awareness about the plight of Ground Zero workers. Mr. Martin also served as executive board member for the National Football Youth Football Initiative, focused on molding, teaching, and instructing NFL coaches, facilities, and players. He is a board member of the New York Football Giants alumni, where he focuses on integrating disenfranchised former team members back into productive roles within society. As a former team board member and Distinguished Achievement Award recipient at Fairleigh Dickinson University, Mr. Martin is still involved in numerous university fundraising efforts. He was the honorary president of Tomorrow's Child's Fund and honorary dinner chairman of the Make a Wish Foundation. Please join me and bringing up the great Mr. George D. Martin. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, I think no more needs to be said. You are dismissed. <laughs> Uh, it is a wonderful pleasure to be here, and, and it's quite an honor, and it's one that I do not take for granted to uh, be able to come to you on this esteemed occasion. Howard, before I begin, I would like to uh, publicly thank all of the sponsors who've been a part of making this uh, come to fruition. I'd also like to thank a host of friends that I have out in the audience, and there's an individual who I'd like to thank specifically because I spent my morning today visiting a local uh, grade school uh, kicking off a literacy initiative on the importance of reading. And I did that in conjunction with Newark's finest, Newark PD. And I would like to just recognize the head of that program and the head of that uh, initiative, uh, Captain Douglas. Is Captain Douglas here? He went to the hospital. Is he okay? Oh, okay. 
Captain Douglas, but he has uh, some of his representatives. I'd like to uh, have those members of the Newark Police. Please stand. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of that. It was an absolute honor to talk to those little kids about the importance of reading because that is the foundation of our educational pursuit. I also would like to uh, recognize a couple of other people with your indulgence, if you would. Um, there's a, a young lady who has been instrumental in all of the things that were mentioned previously. She has been a constant supporter uh, of, of George Martin and the New York Giants and all of our social endeavors. Uh, she's here tonight. Uh, she is a newlywed along with her husband. Uh, Ms. Angela Thompson and Vincent. <laughs> you know, it's been said that behind every great man, um, there is a woman who tells him what he does wrong. That woman, unfortunately, is not here tonight. Angela, you're sworn to secrecy, you didn't hear that. <laughs> but I'd like to thank my wife of uh, currently 47 years, my wife Diana, my high school sweetheart, in her absence. <laughs> However, in her stead is my other wife. <laughs> you heard, and I will t make note of it uh, a little bit later on, about the journey for 911, which saw us walk from the George Washington Bridge all the way to San Diego, California. Well, it's nice, it's great to have a partner who is with you every step of the way. And that individual brought me so much confidence and confidence. And uh, he was someone who never left my side, and it was a great, great honor to have done that journey with him and I'll never forget it. I'd like to, to say hello to my great friend and my brother Lee Reeve and his lovely wife. Please stand. <laughs> Having said all that, uh, there's just one other group that I would like to recognize because I've been working with them here in Newark for the last 11 years. And uh, they uh, really, boy, they are a reflection of, of what George Martin tries to do each and every day of his life, and that is bring hope to people. Uh, they are the members of Newark Beth Israel. Uh, they are standing in the back, uh, Marilyn. <laughs> the journey continues. Let me start off by saying this. It is almost a physical impossibility for me to be standing before you here today. It is, a, um, it is remarkable, I always said this, that this kind of puts us in the context. If there's ever a remake of the movie called It's a Wonderful Life, they got to give me the starring role, okay? They have to, because from where George Martin originated from, in the backwoods, and I mean backwoods of Greenville, South Carolina, where running water wasn't an option, where daily cleansing was unheard of, when education was never mentioned, to rise to where I am today, against all odds, is a wonderful miracle. And that says two things. My estimation that says that uh, George Martin had some wonderful upbringing despite all of the obstacles that laid before him. And secondly, though some of you may take issue with it, it is a wonderful country to be able to produce someone of that magnitude under those circumstances. I grew up with what I consider, and there's a, there's a vast dichotomy between uh, what I consider myself as a baby boomer and just for argument's sake, let's say millennials, which I know you all may claim that right now. <laughs> I grew up with such deprivation when it came down to uh, uh, knowing your roots and your inheritance that it was almost sinful. I have two pictures, only two surviving pictures of what George Martin was as an infant. Never knew my lineage, never knew my background. Uh, and that extended on to uh, the plight of African Americans. I grew up with almost the inability to be able to read, and I thirst and I hungered for what my roots were. I wanted to be able to understand where I came from as a person, but also where I came from as a people. And that luxury was never afforded to me. I just want to make a comparison, if I, I will. You know, back in the days in the backwoods of Greenville, South Carolina, you heard things through the rumor mill. You know, you may have heard things about uh, a doctor who uh, ha had the civil rights movement. You might have heard about this guy named Martin Luther King, but uh, it was kind of stifled because people didn't want to, to, to think of you as an activist because you were a troublemaker, see? So we didn't get those kind of information readily back in the, in the backwoods. The contrast is simply this. Versus baby boomers versus millennials, 
Everything today is at the touch of your finger. The vast majority of my preparation tonight came from research on the cell phone or technology. No such technology existed when I was a young man growing up. We had to search, we had to scour. And that's where I learned about where the term his story came from. Because our story was trivialized if it was mentioned at all. It was always his story. And that's why I developed such an avid thirst for learning about African American history. My apologies to the crowd, because I had taken the liberty of uh, shipping some, uh, some prints. They're called Harper's Weekly. And if you have an opportunity to look on your phone, Harper's Weekly. Back at the turn of the previous century, Harper's Weekly was a, uh, a social weekly mag magazine that, that talked about uh, social events that took place in society. And one of the things that they highlighted was the plight of African Americans. I took the liberty of shipping out, shipping out eight of those, uh, those Harper's Weeklies, which I've since then had framed. They're probably part of a 30 frame collection that I have. And it, and it paints, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. It paints a very, very bleak and dark picture of what African American was like back at the, the previous century. To give you an example, it talked about how blacks uh, in this one caption had to travel, but they had to go from section to section and show their papers. And if they didn't have their papers, they would be considered escaped slaves and they'd be returned back to their, their, their masters. That's the oppression that we had to live under. And then one of my favorites is an old man who's sitting around this big pot, this cauldron, if you will, and he's cooking dinner. And the comment is, that possum smelled powerful good. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but that was one of the mainstays back in the day. Possum, raccoon, that was part of our diet back in the day. I bring this up not to, um, not to denigrate our past. I bring this up so you guys can see the vast journey of which we have traveled. And it is a vast journey. And I am so thankful that we have been able to overcome all of that. And I'm so thankful that institutions like this exist. Now admittedly, back in my day, institutions like this did not carry, at least down in the uh, the Deep South did not carry African American literature. You couldn't find it with a, with, a, with a compass. And that is what helped develop the drive for George Martin. And so in addition to those Harper's Weekly that unfortunately we don't have, I also brought with me a collection of my uh, personal African American memorabilia, which numbers over 300 different um, volumes. So in preparation for this, I started packing my bags and I started getting these books that I wanted to share with you this evening. And my wife looked at me and she says, you idiot, you can't take all those books back there with <laughs> So she went through the editing process with me and I brought along a few books what I'd like to just share with you if I can that show you what helped mold the person that stands before you. But before that, I do that, I'd like you to know that I've, I've dissected my presentation into three distinct categories. First category that we all have participated in, and by virtue of you being here tonight, is what we call celebration. The ability for us to come as a group, as a collection, and look at what we've done, and to rejoice in that. That's what we do annually with regard to African American History Month, the celebration. The second part, however, we want to look at, and we want to call, shall we say, just rededication. What will we do with all of the giants whose shoulders we stand on? What will we do with their accomplishments? How will we allow that to mold and, 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 and allow us to go forward? What will we do with those tremendous strides? How will it impact us? Well, I can tell you this, that for George Martin, um, it is, it is everything. It is absolutely everything. Because without those individuals who I look up to and who admired, I dare say that I would not be standing before you tonight. And the third group, the segment I would call um, just adoration. Adoration for all of those giants, looking at what they've accomplished, looking at how they had to overcome the institutional prejudice, how they had to come, the daily struggle, how they had to overcome, and how that should impact us. 
So I'm going to very quickly, I'm going to step away from the, the stanchion, if you will, and I'm going to go over and I just want to highlight some of those, those tremendous individuals whose name should not be lost in the history of the annals of the past. Okay? I'm sure that a lot of them uh, will bring a reference because some of us mentioned earlier, uh, and, and some of us will remember the great accomplishments of the past, but I think that their accomplishment bears repeating. And I tried to do it in a manner that was sort of like at least segmented uh, from the past coming up to the present. And some of them are a collective endeavor, and the last of them are just individual accomplishments, but all of them are vitally important. I'm going to tell you, because you guys, you guys may have heard this, um, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson. Those names ring a bell? Got it? The movie? Ah, yes. Where, who said that? Hid hidden figures. Hidden figures. Now I got to tell you, I feel like a fool. I, I really do. Hampton, Virginia is a stone's throw away from Greenville, South Carolina. I had no idea, none whatsoever. And although these three magnificent women who were highlighted in that film, they were merely the tip of the iceberg. There was a whole sea of African-American women who helped put a man on the moon. I'll say it again, yes, absolutely, absolutely. whole group of African Americans. I mean, I was so proud when I saw that movie, I wanted to kiss the director. <laughs> this one I did hear about, but I didn't know the magnitude. Hollywood brought it to fruition, entitled Harry. That gonna make me about to cry now, see, because, see, in this day and age, you know, with uh, that technology I talked about, you know, you can plug in any address. It'll take you from door to door. Global positioning satellite, GPS, right? And by the way, on your way, you're going to stop at a high Regency. You're going to stop at a Holiday Inn. You're going to stop at a McDonald's. You're going to stop at, you know, as, a, as the Bible says, it's, it's so simple that a fool need not error, right? Herod ain't had none of that. Herod did not have any of it. Imagine, if you will, a woman who was subjected to so much, so much prejudice, hatred, dehumanization, you name it, who had the ability, who had the will, who had the dog determination that, as Malcolm X would say, by any means necessary. She escaped. She made it north. She followed the northern star. And she attained the most precious gift that you could imagine. Freedom. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to look you in the eye and I'm going to tell you the truth. Be it George Martin, had I made that escape, had I done Man, you ain't getting me to go back down there. Uh, I'm t I'm, no, it ain't happening. I done made it to the promised land. What'd she do? She went back. She went back, and she went back, and she went back, and over 300 individuals she led on the Underground Railroad to freedom. Now you talk about celebrating strong African-American women. Do I need to go further? Of the many books and all those books that I got, and I'm going to continue, but the last book, which Hollywood paid tribute to, let me get down here and show you. Y'all see this one? Oh, yeah, what is it? I know it's a green book, but what is it? <laughs> Y'all see that movie, Green Book? Wow. Wow. And by the way, I thought the Green Book was just for hotels. No. Man, are you kidding? Car repair, gas stations, taverns, you know, it's all in the Green Book. And it's all 
was for us. And the reason it was green was because it was developed by an African American whose last name was Green. And he did it because, y'all know what sundown laws are? Yeah, I know those of us with gray hair are, you know, for lack of better, uh, we know what sundown laws are. And that is that you cannot be caught in certain towns after sundown. And by the way, that was played out, it was dramatized in the movie, the Green Book. This was a lifesaver. This was a lifesaver to many African American travelers, including me and my family. In 1965, my dad got transferred from Savannah, Georgia to the Napa Valley of California. And the only way for us to get there was dad loaded us up in his old, that, that, that Chevy wagon with the fake wood on the side. And we drove across country, okay? Now, the Green Book didn't help us uh, to find a place to stay. And we didn't have the money. The Green Book helped us by finding a place where we shouldn't be. Okay, which was equally important. It was, you know, because like I said, you don't want to be caught in those kind of places. You don't. And the Green Book had a profound impact on George Martin. How much time we got? I know I'm just running my mouth, but I'm so, what, you know, we good? We good? Okay. Now, I talked about African-American women. Now, this is not a novel. This is a, this is a, a book depicting uh, beautiful, Beautiful African American women, and it's it's by Mary White. Okay, she's an artist, and the girl's hands have been blessed by God. Oh, I'm gonna pass this one around, but I got somebody back there watching it, so don't you know, <laughs> eh, eh, don't don't try to make it out of here, Angela. Okay, <laughs> but it shows you. Uh, I think Bill Withers came up with the song "Grandma's Hands." Y'all know how precious a black mother's hands are. They just the right medicine when you need it. Whether you need correction or whether you need direction. Okay? <laughs> now, let me tell you, homeboy, <laughs> I know grandma's hands and I know mom's hands too. She kept us on the straight and narrow. The man called Brown Condor. Okay? You remember me talking about the Tuskegee Airmen? And that they weren't the first? You see, there was always the pioneers, the people who came before. He didn't have the opportunities here in America, so he fled abroad. He fled to France. He had the ardent desire he was going to be a pilot come hell or high water. And over there, he got the opportunity and became an absolute hero. And by the way, he wasn't the only one. No, he wasn't the only one. Where's my other book at? Oh, here he is. Eugene Bullard. The world's first black fighter pilot. You guys read this book, I'm telling you. You would think you'd be able to fly without wings. What the boy did was unbelievable. I had excerpts in here that I wanted to, to go over, but time does not allow me to do it. But what he did very similar to the one that I just talked about, um, was he got his legitimacy abroad because it wasn't to be found here. And you would think after he had done all of those miraculous accomplishments, when he came back here, he would be heralded. Wasn't to be. Got another reference for you. you guys, have got another reference for you, which it's, it's, you guys know that we just lost Jesse Norman. Well, I know you guys know that because it's, yeah. She's opera singer, African-American, never even knew she existed. Home, home girl had lungs. She had it for real. But if I tell you about the name of Doris Miller, who can help me out? Yep, yes ma'am. She right on. You guys saw the movie Pearl Harbor? Okay, now, now follow me on this. Pearl Harbor, this is, this is, I'm not making this up. You know, attack of Pearl Harbor, we are being bombarded, literally being surprise attack, and, and, and all hell is breaking loose. People are dying by the handfuls. And as this ship is being attacked, 
there is a ship steward. You know, we were relegated to certain jobs, cooking and helping the officers get dressed. We were servants. And it was forbidden. It was absolutely forbidden for us African Americans to handle a weapon. They thought it might be pointed in the wrong direction. But anyway, under these extreme circumstances, this young man manned a machine gun, Doris Miller. And he went to work. And he downed several enemy aircraft. And you know what they did for him? They gave him anonymity. Which means, yeah, we recognize what you did, but we're not going to say who you are. Until now. Who can tell me what the honor has been bestowed upon him posthumously? This young man, young man, what's your name, son? <laughs> what there, is a, there is a right that's been reserved from day one for a former president's only, and that is to have your name on a United States aircraft carrier. Homeboy has just got that recognition, okay? Ooh, man, that one, that one gets me. Um, <laughs> you might know who Kathy Williams is? Know who Kathy Williams is? You guys know what a Buffalo soldier is? Okay. A Buffalo soldier, by its very definition, is male, right? With one exception. Female. And she had to impersonate being a male. She came out of bondage, she came out of slavery, and she joined the Buffalo Soldiers and distinguished herself as the only female, black or white, ever to be a part of that regiment. Talking about groundbreaking? Wow. Unbelievable. Did you guys ever see that show uh, called The Lone Ranger? Y'all saw The Lone Ranger? Hiles Silver, away! <laughs> yeah, let me introduce you to the Lone Ranger. Well, Y'all ain't seen this Lone Ranger. You ain't seen that Lone Ranger. This is the original Lone Ranger. This is the real Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves detailed his exploits as one of the first um, lawmen in the West and his exploits and what he did. So phenomenal that Hollywood said that we're going to take it and we're going to make it appropriate for television. We're going to put him on a white horse with an Indian friend and a white face. This is the Lone Ranger. And by the way, it's been verified that he is an ancestor that gentleman over there by the name of Lee Reeves. So, <laughs> Oprah, Winfrey, um, Oprah Winfrey was the first African-American millionaire, right? What? She wasn't? All right, y'all pass, stop. <laughs> Madam C.J. Walker. Well, she right up in Harlem, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, sister's always gonna have the hair tight. You know that, you know. That, that should, but talking about entrepreneurial spirit, there it is right there. Madam C.J. Walker. Now this question, again, is for everybody before I conclude. How many people have had the, the pleasure and the honor of going down to the African American Museum down in Washington, D.C. Have mercy. Have mercy. A fool's errand. This is about the gentleman who runs the African American Museum down there. And if you haven't been there, if you haven't been there, if you haven't been there, then you have got to go. You know, it encompasses everything, I think, that, that is humanly possible. And you can't see it in one day. You can't see it all in one day. But I tell you what, it is remarkable and it is worth seeing. Okay, I'm getting a high sign, so, okay. So, it was mentioned in my introduction about Arthur Ashe, but there was a predecessor 12 years before Arthur Ashe won his gold. 
and she lived right here in Newark. Yes, she did. I had the opportunity of meeting her one day. And I, I'm sad to say it wasn't a happy meeting. Because she didn't get the adulation. She didn't get the respect. She did not get the notoriety of having won a major, being the first African-American female to do so. And she harbored deep, deep resentment for it. That's some of the pain that's been inflicted upon us when we only include his story. General Colin Powell, okay? Have mercy. Have, four star general, I'm sorry. Four star general Colin Powell. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, first African American. And also served in the administration. This guy, when you meet, if you ever have the opportunity to meet Colin Powell, he just exudes. You just want to get next to him and hope some of it rubs off. Because the man, I'm, he's remarkable. The confidence, the intelligence, the ability that he has, it's just, it's, it's so. Let me get down. Muhammad Ali, it goes without saying. Yes, we know, we know. Uh, this guy, his name is Rocky Johnson. Uh, just from a sports standpoint, Rocky Johnson was uh, one of the first African American uh, superstars, and uh, he actually from Canada. Okay, but what's great about this, and all the trials and tribulations that he had to overcome, he produced a son. The Rock. Can you smell what the Rock's been cooking? <laughs> I conclude with this. I conclude this portion with this. About a little silver-haired lady who had put in a hard day's work. She was riding home from her toil. She was asked to give up her seat. She had the courage to say no. Rosa Parks, okay? I think that's one of the linchpins of our current modern day success is this woman's courage, her will not to give in. Say status quo, not today, I'm sorry. You guys want to know what motivates us as a people? You want to know what, what George Martin thirst and desired to see was to find all of those individuals that look like me. That blazed the trail for me. So now I'm going to focus on the last portion of my presentation, and that is the reaffirmation. With the presupposition, again, that the fact that you're here, I assume that you're already committed to affirming. How is it that we can continue to contribute to the greater cause? Man, it's simple. See those people that I just talked about in those books? Emulate them. Find that will, find that determination, find that wherewithal. If you look at the picture of the Pettus Bridge march, you know Dr. Martin Luther King? Did he cross that bridge by himself? He didn't cross that bridge by himself. Courage takes on all forms. Sacrifice takes on many, many aspects. And I'm thinking about some of the people who gave the ultimate sacrifice when I think about the church bombing down in Alabama when four of our beautiful, bright, young angels were killed. Can you imagine what the sacrifice those parents made? Couldn't sacrifice any of my kids. Love them too much. I got four. Couldn't do it. So... As I close, I say this to you. You may ask the obligatory question, what is it that you can do and how is it that you can contribute? Let me take the moment and read something that has been just a mainstay in my life, very, very important. And it's called, figure it out for yourself. Okay? Bear with me just one moment and then we'll conclude. Figure it out for yourself. Figure it out for yourself, my lad. 
You have all that the greatest of men have had. Two arms, two hands, two legs, two eyes, and a brain to use if you would be wise. With this equipment, they all began. So start for the top and say, I can. Look them over, the wise and the great, because they all took their food from a common plate. And similar knives and forks they used, with similar laces they tied their shoes. The world's considered them brave and smart, but you've all they had when they made their start. You can triumph and come to skill. You can be great if only you will. You're well equipped for what flight you choose. You have legs and arms and a brain to use. And the man who rises great deeds to do began his plight with no more than you. You are the handicap which you must face. You are the one who must choose your place. You must say where you want to go, how much you will study the truth to know. God has equipped you for life, but he lets you decide what you want to be. Courage must come from the soul within. The man must furnish the will to win. So figure it out for yourself, my lad. You were born with all that the greatest have had. With your equipment, they all begin. Get a hold of yourself and say, I can. Thank you. I understand that we are going to have a Q&A period. So um, if there are questions that you have for George Martin, I will be more than delighted to entertain them at this point in time. So raise your hand, and I'll simply call on you. And by the way, it's always been my experience that nobody ever wants to ask the first question. <laughs> yes, sir, we have a, someone in the back. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Dashan Farad. And uh, in 1998, when I was an undergrad, I remember ESPN had did a special series or an episode asking the question or investigating why is it that black athletes are not vocal when it comes to social issues for the most part. So I want to ask you, uh, dear brother, as we can see, that still stands to this day. We don't seem to have many Paul Robesons or Muhammad Ali's. So I want to ask you, brother, why do you feel that to this day, most black athletes seem to be scared to speak out when it comes to, uh, you know, police brutality, racism, white supremacy, as we see our brother uh, Colin Kaepernick doing? Well, uh, first of all, let me say I, I, that's presumptuous on your part, because if you look very closely, you'll see that Colin Kaepernick did not stand alone when he made that profession. There are a multitude of athletes uh, who stand up for injustice and have spoken out loudly. And I would not grace their memory by saying that there aren't. Um, there, are, there are social issues that guys take up every single day. By the way, if you look at the swath of, of just in the NFL of guys who have charities that address all of these issues on a multitude of fronts, be it homelessness, be it food banks, be it education itself, I think if you knew that, sir, and you knew the truth, you would make a different statement. Well, I can tell you this, sir, unequivocally that I myself went on CNN, you can check it, you can research it, and I made a statement on behalf of Colin Kaepernick and I was not by myself, trust me. Question, yes ma'am, you had a question. You were quite, thank you, thank you. That's a great question. Her question was, I'll repeat it, um, was how did I bridge the deprivation that I had as a child in order to arrive where I am today? And I will tell you, uh, part of it had to do with the transition, moving from uh, the downward, backward south where I was born, eventually going to Savannah, Georgia, and eventually uh, moving out to, um, to the Napa Valley of California. Through that evolution, uh, it was a, uh, a cultural seismic event. Uh, where I went to, and I was born in a, a segregated environment, 
And because of that matriculation, I wound up in an integrated environment. I then focused on two things, um, uh, education and sports. And I used the latter in order to get to the, the, the former. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, I realized that I had to align myself, because you always have the option. You're going to see people who you're going to face that are negative and positive. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out which. And I aligned myself to, uh, with a lot of very well-meaning white individuals and black individuals who wanted to see George Martin fulfill his whole potential. And uh, were it not for that, and the most recent one was a uh, professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University who recently passed away, his name is Kenneth T. Birkin. And he's the reason I stand before you, not only with my undergrad degree, but also two doctors as well. And that's the first in my entire living generation to ever that are around sports, how do we use sports as a vehicle to train for a traditional skill, whether it's Spanish children, black children? Thank you. I'll be very brief in that, but it's a very easy um, answer. Again, I talked about gravitating to people who want to see you succeed and, and have your best interest in, at heart. Uh, there was a gentleman who was my high school basketball coach. His name, his name was Ed Hopkins. He was a white guy, okay? And Ed Hopkins treated me like he was his son. In fact, he introduced me into his family as his long lost son. Unheard of coming from the South, unheard of. He, he approached me not, um, not catering to me. He just approached me as a matter of fact. This guy has all the qualities, be black or white, that I admire and I respect. And he came to me one day and he said this, and this was during the height of the Vietnam War. He said, George, you have a younger brother. He said, and that younger brother looks up to you. He said, but I want you to know this, that there, because I was a high school, high school All-American and All-State and student body president, he said, you have to succeed, not for your own success, but for all of those who are coming behind you, who are looking to you as an example. To me, that was profound. That had a profound impact on me. And by the way, once I got into the pros, once I went to college and all that stuff, don't forget the guy, Bill Parcells. Bill Parcells, I think, nearly adopted me for a variety of reasons. But if you ever look at that NFL clip when we won the Super Bowl and Bill Parcells made the following statement, for the rest of your life, nobody can ever tell you that you can't do it. People thought he was talking about football. Yes. George, first let us thank you for your inspirational and educational presentation, which certainly inspired and motivated us. Thank you, man. How would you equate Paul Robeson, who had a total package, a great athlete, a great scholar, and a great entertainer? Because most of the people we talk about had a transformation in their life. Mm -hmm. But here we have an African-American, born a great athlete, a great entertainer, and a great scholar. In my college dorm room, above my bed, there was a picture of Paul Robeson. Uh, although he was in, in, uh, in stage uniform, he had a cloak. Um, and I admired him because he had that deep baritone voice. He was, just, he was larger than life. And to me, Paul Robeson uh, was someone who I looked up to beyond sports because he transcended sports. Yes, he was, uh, he was all of that and a bag of chips when he was playing, but he was also more than that. And that's why I never answer. If people always say, hey, weren't you a football player? I always say no. Not because I'm lying, but because from my perspective, since day one, I didn't play at my profession. No more than you played at yours. Yes, I was a professional athlete, but I wasn't a football player. Okay? I took it very seriously. And by the way, I will say this, that during my career, at the height of my career, 
the percentage of individuals who didn't have college degrees was up around 87% had never graduated from college. So the person who you're standing before, before you not only was the Giants uh, captain, uh, the consultant against drug abuse, the player rep for 13 of the 14 years and president of the NFL Players Association, I also started, which I'm the most proud of, the very first formal degree completion program for the New York Football Giants in conjunction with Fairleigh Dickinson University, which subsequently was observed by the National Football League and as a result was replicated among all 32 NFL teams. If you want to talk about a legacy for George Martin, it's not the Super Bowl ring that I wear, nor the Hall of Fame ring, of which both I'm infinitely proud of. It is the legacy of knowing that education was a paramount primary concern for George Martin during and after his career. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will say, oh, you have a question? Yes, please, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for a beautiful lecture. You're quite welcome. I really learned a lot from you. I would like to know, do you think the best, the college basketball players should be getting paid while they're in school? No, ma'am. Before they I, become professional? No, ma'am, I do not. I think that all college athletes, basketball, football, baseball, I think that when you look at the revenues generated by those sports, it is an, it is an abomination. It is absolutely, it boils my blood to think that, the, but, oh, Lord, I don't get tongue-tied very often, but boy, that one, that one shapes me. It really, in, in all the wrong places, okay? Yes, they should be compensated. And by the way, that compensation should not necessarily come immediately. Put it in a trust, make it interest bearing, so that when they graduate or when their commitment is done with, they walk away with something more than scars and, and, and ailments. So, one, one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. That was a great presentation. By the way, call me George, guys. <laughs> I keep thinking, my dad, where is my dad? <laughs> George, thank you. Any man who has two doctorate, I'll call him Mr. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? That's a great question. The question was, how would I like to be remembered? Obviously, he knows something that I don't know. <laughs> we all going there. <laughs> you know, uh, the great thing that I, that I really revel in is this, that when people reference George Martin, whenever they talk about how kind I was and how I stopped, no matter what I was doing, to give an autograph and I encourage a kid, and you know why I do that? I think the Bible says something that uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. My, my fiance and I were out to dinner one night in Eugene, Oregon, which had never seen black couples before. Okay? We're sitting at this table and we were just celebrating um, the fact that we had gotten engaged. And we had a wonderful dinner, only African Americans in the place. And at the conclusion of the dinner, the waiter came over and he brought us a check. And he said, sir, your dinner has been paid. And I said, oh, wow. I said, great. I said, who do I have to thank for this? He said, anonymous. And I'm going to tell you this. You're a poor kid from the South. You can't make ends meet, and somebody does you a kindness. To this day, I have never forgotten that, so I know how it feels. So every time I meet someone, I want them to remember the guy who would pay their tab, give them an autograph, give them a kind word, and expect nothing in return. That's paying it forward, okay? That's paying it forward. Was that, that, was that the last one? Okay, well, again, I'd like to thank Newark Public Library. I would like to thank all the, the sponsors wholeheartedly. And I'd like to thank Miss Celeste Bateman. All right, Miss Celeste. I will be here at the conclusion of the evening if there are additional comments or, or statements or questions you might have. But thank you all very much for coming. Let's give it up for Mr. George Martin one more time. Let's give it up to our sponsors for the event.
And let's give it up to all of you for coming out and making this a wonderful event in our history. Thank you.